Good morning. I'm Bel Jarneski, and I'm the chair of the Holocaust Education Center of the Jewish Heritage Center of Western Canada. Dr. Bessner, Father Desbois, Dr. Christie, dear survivors, educators, students, and honored guests. Today marks the 12th year since the inception of our Holocaust Symposium, and it was a dream of the late Hirsch Sentner of blessed memory, a passionate Holocaust educator who traveled extensively throughout our province to the smallest of schools, the tiniest of groups, Hirsch was convinced of the importance of remembering this tragic chapter of history and the immense loss that it represents to humanity. Inspired by a Holocaust Symposium in 2001 at the University of Victoria, at which Hirsch had been invited to be the keynote speaker, along with one of our survivors, Isaac Gottfried, and although already ill, Hirsch sprang into action, organizing the first ever Holocaust Symposium right here in Duckworth Center in 2002. The keynote speakers that year were Leon Bass and Ken McVeigh. Bass was among the first American soldiers to enter Buchenwald concentration camp. An African American, he recalled suffering the oppression and humiliation of being a second-class citizen in his own army. Ken McVeigh, whom Hirsch had heard speak in Victoria, was the founder of the Nice Corps Project, one of the first and largest websites to ho combat Holocaust denial. Sadly, Hirsch was not well enough to attend the inaugural symposium, and we carry on each year in his memory. For the past 12 years, we have had the honor of welcoming many inspiring keynote speakers, many of them Shoah survivors, who have graciously shared their painful stories with us. For the last several years, our local survivors have shared their stories with students in smaller groups across campus in the afternoon session of the symposia. This afternoon, we present an exciting new format a panel discussion entitled Voices of Courage and Survival, featuring two Shoah survivors, two survivors of African genocides, and a survivor of our tragic residential school's experience. Tomorrow night, we invite all of you to another special evening, an extraordinary opportunity to hear two champions of human rights. Our keynote speaker today, Father Patrick Desbois, and Lieutenant General, the Honorable Romeo Dallaire, in dialogue together for the first time, speaking on the topic of indifference. Join us at Sherazetic Synagogue at 7.30. Admission is free. But before I continue, I need to recognize those who made this day possible. The Grossberg Family Fund of the Jewish Foundation of Manitoba, which is the major funder of this symposium, and to David Cohen, as well as to Gail Asper and Michael Patterson, thank you. To Dr. Axworthy and the University of Winnipeg. To Dr. James Christie and the Ritt Institute for Religion and Global Policy of the Global College for all your support and encouragement throughout. Thanks also to Keith Bellamy, Angelina Turney, and Anise Ibrahim for helping us pull it all together logistically, and also Anthony Tordeff. Thank you most especially to my talented, organized, hardworking, and reliable symposium coordinator, my right hand, Roberta Mallon, without whom I would be lost. To our wonderful symposium committee, who are also volunteering today, and our other young volunteers, to Sergio Glogowski, the president of the Jewish Heritage Center of Western Canada, and to Alana Abrams, Dan Carboni, and Ava Block Super at our offices. And now, I have the very distinct honor of introducing to you our most distinguished speaker. Father Patrick Desbois was born in chalons sur saone France, in 1955. His grandfather had been imprisoned in the Ukrainian prison camp at Ravaruska during World War II. And although he spoke little of what had occurred there, he often said, for others, it was worse. For years, young Patrick did not know what these others were or what their worst face enta fate entailed. His grandfather's experience remained obscure until, at age 12, he found a library book about the Shoah. 
The book's pages revealed images of the genocide he had known only as a distant, painful family mystery. One picture in particular finally gave meaning to his grandfather's words, a photograph of Jewish men and women in the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. The others were these Jews. Their fate was worse because it was unimaginable. From that day forward, Father Dubois saw Jewish history as inextricably tied to his own. While passion for his own religion would later bring him to the clergy, he longed to understand the religion of those whose agony his grandfather had witnessed. In 2002, Father Dubois traveled to Ukraine so he could finally see where his grandfather and the others had suffered. What shocked Father Desbois was not what he saw, but what he did not see. Father Desbois knew that 10,000 Jews had been killed there, but he saw no marking or memorial of any kind. When he asked the town's mayor at the time where the Jews were buried, the mayor replied simply, we don't know anything about that. Father Desbois began to ask questions. He quickly learned that since the massacre, there had been little investigation into what had occurred and no proper documentation of it. Yet, as Father Dubois further explored the town, he realized that the massacre's presence had not entirely vanished. The elderly spoke little about the past, but it lurked over the village in marked silence. In 2004, in an effort to lift this silence, Father Dubois helped create Yachad in Unum, the words for together in Hebrew and in Latin, along with the late French Cardinal Jean-Marie Lustiger and Rabbi Israel Singer. The organization funds missions by research teams to Ukraine, Russia, Belarus, Moldova, Romania, and Poland to interview those who, like Father Dubois' grandfather, witnessed the ultimate evil. In these interviews, witnesses can finally give voice to what they saw. Father Desbois listens with the sensitivity of a priest and probes with the curiosity of a detective. His aim is, and always has been, to unleash the truth and the stories of those who perished. Father Desbois' work has served as a groundbreaking starting point for the Ukraine to begin to examine this dark chapter in its history which was silenced in large part by the Soviet regime. Desbois' much praised exhibit on his research has in fact been shown in schools and colleges throughout Ukraine and led to the Ukrainian foreign minister making statements in favor of recognizing and dealing with the subject, a major step forward. His award-winning book, The Holocaust by Bullets, published in 2008, documents his investigations up to that point in time. Father Dubois has been recognized internationally for his extraordinary achievements and efforts by several universities who have granted him the degree of Doctorate of Human Letters Honoris Causa, as well as other major awards, including the Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur. And as you heard Dr. Bessner mention, on Friday morning, this university will add to that list of tributes when it confers upon him the degree of Doctorate of Divinity, Honoris Causa. As we look towards the future, we face the challenge of how we will continue to remember at a time when even the grandchildren of our survivors will be gone. As we struggle with the answer, it is clear that one of the ways will be the terrible story of the Shoah, that is, the narrative of the individual human stories. The Shoah must be part, must become part of our entire human narrative. Father Dubois' willingness to record the stories of non-Jews, their testimony to what happened, is perhaps a necessary first step in assuring that the tragedy of the Shoah becomes a narrative belonging to all of humanity. For if not, we take the terrible risk that one day, far off into the future, when the survivors, the second generation, 
and even the third generation are gone, the Shoah will become but an anomaly of history. We cannot allow that to happen. The Shoah, most tragically, is a human story. And if we do not hear that it is a human story, we will have not learned anything. Good morning, everybody. And uh, first of all, thank you to have uh, been courageous to go out in the morning with snow in this first day of May. Don't worry, we have the same situation in France. We had snow last week in Paris. First, I would like to explain why, as a Catholic French priest, originally from Burgundy, what I'm doing in the killing fields of Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, Poland, Romania, Moldavia, and now in a few weeks, Lithuania. My grandfather was deported by the German in 42 in a camp of Soviet prisoners, a German camp in a small village called Ravaruska. It's today in Ukraine. And he came back. My grandfather was a very funny person. But when we said Ravaruska, it was finished. He refused to speak. He refused to say one word. And my grandmother was crying. And me as a child, I said, why does it? he says nothing? So I asked him hundreds of times, perhaps more than hundred, what happened, grandfather, in Ravaruska? And as he kept silence, I was thinking perhaps he did something bad. So one day I told him, perhaps you killed somebody. So he was very upset. He told me, no, I was a prisoner. He told me, we had no food in the camp. We had really no drink. But outside the camp was worse, and it was finished. He never said anything anymore. He died when I was a teenager. I forgot the story. And one day, I was your age, I went to prepare a pilgrimage of students to meet the Pope John Paul II in Czestochowa, in Poland. So absolutely nothing to do with Holocaust. And we, we went to prepare to make economy of money, because when you go with students, you know nobody has money. And it was in December. I lost my way, and I asked to people in the night, but where, where am I? And people told me, you are near Ravaruska. And I was just near the village where my grandfather was deported. I couldn't sleep all the night. I realized that my grandfather, non-Jew, military, French, has been deported in a Jewish region where everybody nearly has been killed during the war. It was called, the nickname of Rabbi Ruska was Rava the Jew, because the population was 75% Jew. So, I decided to study Holocaust. I knew nothing. I don't know if you know something about Holocaust, but me, I knew nothing. So I went to Israel, to Yad Vashem, seven times to follow sessions about Holocaust. And after I say, okay, but it didn't happen in Jerusalem. It happened there. So I decided to go back to Ukraine, to Ravaruska. I found back the camp of my grandfather. He was, the camp was still there with the building, the gate, and everything. And I asked also, but where are the mass graves of the Jews? Because I knew that in this small village, they shot 18,000 Jews, and also a certain group of gypsies. And we don't know the number. And also communists, and also partisans, all together minimum of 40,000 people killed in the village. And today, it's not like Winnipeg. It's a very small village. 
So I went to see the mayor, the municipality, and you know, it was not like now, it was Soviet regime. So he told me, we don't know. They killed them in secret. And me, I am from a small village in France. And I know you cannot kill one person, all the village will know. So 15,000 persons, and nobody knows? So I came back three, four times to see the municipality and same answer. Finally, thanks God, the mayor lost the election. A new mayor was elected, and he brought me in a forest in a small village called Borove. You know, it's funny because he had a limousine and there was no asphalt. As I say, there are two places where I've been in a limousine. It's New York and Ravaruska. So we arrived to a small hamlet, only one street, nobody, dogs barking, geese running, and 50 farmers waiting for us. Immediately when we went out of the car, they entered in the forest, and the mayor told me, Patrick, we are at the mass grave of the last 1,500 Jews of Ravaruska. And here I will never forget. I was alone, not like today. No camera like today, no, no TV, no microphone. And these farmers, one by one, they said, we were present at the shooting of the Jews. So the first one, he said, one German came alone with his dog and his motorcycle, and he turned and turned and left. And all the village was asking, what he's looking for? In fact, he was looking where to dig the mass grave. Now we know that in this village, they sent only one German. He's the specialist of the digging. He's like an architect of the mass grave. He chose the place, and he makes the plan on the ground. One day after, this German arrived with 30 Jews. They forced the Jews to dig the mass grave themselves, eight meters deep. And he remembers every detail. He remembers the German were buried during the digging. So they put a gramophone. You know, it's not like now that you have MP3 or iPod. It was gramophone. And they listened German music in the forest. And one was playing harmonica. And he broke his harmonica. And later, with metallic detector, we found the pieces of harmonica, of German harmonica. After, they said to the Jews, now you are tired. You should go out of the grave and sit on the grass. And they did it. And secretly, one policeman went down in the grave and put explosive under the ground. After half an hour, they said to the Jews, now you can go on digging. And the 30 Jews exploded. At that moment, when the first witness told me that, a lady arrived and told me, father, father, me, I was 14, I was a girl. They told me, come, come. And I had to climb in the trees to take the pieces of corpse of the Jews and to hide them at the bottom of the grave with branches so that the next Jews will not see it. And after, trucks and trucks and trucks of Jews arrived from Ravaruska ghetto. In one day and a half, they killed, they shot 1,500 Jews with only two German, two shooters with carabine and a table and a chair to sit, to rest, and three pushers. Why pushers? Because they established a rule, a law. One bullet, one Jew. One Jew, one bullet, no more. It was a request of the army, of the German army, to make economy of ammunition. So if the Jews were only injured, they were buried alive. And after, in every village of Ukraine, of Belarus, the farmers remember it took three days, the mass grave to die. The same evening, 
Yaroslav the mayor told me, Patrick, what I did for one village, I can do for 100 village. I will never know why he told me that. And I will never know why I said yes. I came back to Paris. I met the cardinal of Paris, who was Jew by family. He told me, why oh, know the story, Patrick? Because my Polish Jewish family has been killed the same way in Beijing, in Poland. I met the chief of the World Jewish Congress in New York. And he said to another, you know what? We are looking for these mass graves since 44, and this guy that we don't know finds them. Finally, we built an organization called Yarad, that you see here. Yarad means together in Hebrew, and Inunum, together in Latin. If you are interested in your school to follow what we are doing, you have a website, yaradinunum.com or .org. And you can receive, if you give your email, every two weeks, the results of our research in English or in French or in Russian. What we are doing? Today, I'm not alone. We are 22 full time. Me, as I say, I am the older guy. But my team, they are 20, 25 years old maximum. Only three French. They are from Ukraine, they are from Russia, they are from Belarus, they are from Germany, they are from Costa Rica, they are from Guatemala. It's a very, very international team, very young. We work in six countries. The first country is Belarus. Belarus means white Russia. It's a country the same size than Swiss. In Belarus, they killed between 400,000 to 600,000 Jews by shooting. We investigate only about the shooting, the shooting not about the camps. That's the map of Poland. This map is a little bit old, but we work mainly in that region for the moment. You know that in Poland there was Auschwitz, there was Treblinka, there was Sobibor, Belzec, so all the extermination camps. But they killed by shooting one Jew per 10, and nobody knew where it was. And they killed also the gypsies, because it, it was not in the, the movie. This movie you show is very old. There is another one. We, we are working now both for the mass grave of the Jews and the gypsies, because we found them. We are the only one also to work about the genocide of the gypsies. And this map is Russia, not the complete Russia, but the occupied Russia. And today, also it's an old map, we are working here. And last, but not least, Ukraine. Ukraine of today. You know, I don't know where you are from, but recently, just I was seated here, and one sister, Catholic sister, who is teaching us in school, she told me, I'm Ukrainian. I said, where are you from? Because I know Ukraine by heart. And she told me, I'm from Ternopil. So Ternopil in the south of Lvov. And just before, a survivor, lady who is at the first rank, she came to see me. And I say, where are you from? She told me, I'm from Lviv. To give you an example, only in that region, they shot 220,000 Jews. Only in one region, one by one. How do we work? These pictures that you see are in Western Ukraine. So this lady works for us. She's Ukrainian. Her name is Vetlana. And she's teacher in the history of art. So normally, nothing to do. 
But when I came the first time, long time ago in Ukraine, I say, it's very good, but I don't speak Ukrainian, I don't speak Russian, I need a translator. And she was the first lady to wait at the airport. I remember with flowers. And she didn't realize, and me neither, that we would work 15 years together in the same job, I would say. And so she knows how to speak to old people. This guy who is on the cart, you see that it's a small village, there is no running water, and there is as much snow in this village that in Winnipeg today. And she asked only the same question, were you here during the war? And if the person says yes, they say, oh, do, were you here during the day of the shooting of the Jews or the gypsies? And if she says yes, they say, oh, you can help us. Because we are looking to find the mass grave of the Jews. And this guy said, yes, I am living in that home. I was present, and I will tell you. So my team is nine person, a professional cameraman, a professional photograph, an historian, metallic detector specialist, etc., and we drive the interview. Here he is. Her name is Maria, and he is the husband of Maria. At the beginning, he didn't want to speak. Or she said, I remember, I was in school, I was like 12 years old, and I remember they have chosen all the Jews in my school and put them on a cart with horses and they brought them to shoot them. And suddenly he stopped his wife and he said, I did the mass grave. Me, I did the mass grave. So we began to understand he was employed to dig the mass grave with 50 other farmers. He remember exactly the size of the mass grave. It was as long as the podium here. And at the two steps, there were stairs on one side, here like here, on one side, on the other side. Why stairs? Because they wanted the Jew to come on this way, to go down and lay on the ground on this side. And the Jews would enter on the other side, would lay on the other side. It's called Sardinen Pakung. And the killers, the shooters, the Germans, were inside the mass grave with machine gun, shooting one by one. Why they have chosen that? Because they said, we have no time. Because the partisans who are against us are in the forest. So we must kill them as quickly as possible. After I told him, you know, I know it's cold, I know it's freezing, I know you are old, but would you accept to bring us to the mass grave? He said, yes. Most of the people, they want to go back. They want to go back. And so it's our van here. And he's going to the mass grave in a rush. He has not been here since 50 years. Here was the way. So now I will explain how did the German. You know that the German did that since June 41 until 44. How does it happen? First, they send the specialist of the mass grave and they prepare the mass grave somewhere. It can be in the forest, it can be in the center of the city, on the market, in front of a supermarket, anywhere, in front of the church, anywhere. Because they say it's not a mass grave. It's only an anti-tank affair. When they decide the day, the Germans are leaving the city in the night to arrive at the village at 6 o'clock in the morning. They surrender the village so that nobody can escape. And they have a high voice most of the time. And they say to the Jews, you will be sent in Palestine. You will be deported in Palestine today, or you will be deported to Kiev, or to work in a field. So please prepare all your belongings, all your affairs, and you gather in the main street five per five, or 10 per 10. Some Jews think it's true. And so they take all their belongings, they take free coats, etc. They put their money in their pocket, and they go on the main street. 
Some Jews don't believe it. They try to rain out in the forest or to hide in attics or anywhere. So the Germans, they know that. So they enter in every farm. If they find a Jew who is hidden, they kill him on the spot. And they put the corpse on cart and horses. So after a certain time, you have a long column of Jews and behind carts and carts with horses of dead Jews. After an official German come and say, direction Palestine, they walk. They think perhaps they will be deported. Don't forget it was Soviet Union. So people could be deported to Gulag by Stalin. They know what it was. So they think they go to the train station. But suddenly, the Germans said, links, links, it's finished. They realize there is no train station. There is no exit. There is no Palestine. There is no field. So the Jews tried to throw their belongings, their jewels, their money, everything, not to give to the German. They forced them to undress completely most of the time. And after, they isolate them five per five or 10 per 10. Why five per five? Because if there are five shooters, one bullet, one Jew. If there are 10 shooters, one bullet, one Jew. They put them in front, they shoot, and the same day they bury them and they bring back all the suits and they will sell them by auction in the market the day after. Here we found a star, a Magen David, near the mass grave. It's one of these Magen David that the girls threw away not to give to the German. But it's important to find evidence because we have to prove the victims were Jew. Because people can tell us, but perhaps it's victim of the Soviet, perhaps they were only communists, perhaps they were partisan. Second situation, and after I will open a debate with you. We are in a school, still in Ukraine, but Eastern Ukraine. We are south of Nyebopetrovsk, for people who know where is Ukraine. It was a Jewish kolkhoz, a Jewish collective farm. So for you who are young, it's complicated to understand. But there were no private farm. It was communist, so everybody was in a kolkhoz or in a sovkhoz. And the Jews too. Most of the Jews were already evacuated because they knew the German would arrive. They had to take a boat, but they could not take everybody because the boats were too small. So they had to leave the old people who already didn't want to go. And if they were married with non-Jews, they couldn't bring the non-Jews. So they let the mother with the children with the half-Jews. It means one mother or one father Jew. Suddenly, the German arrived, and they say, we will kill all the children, babies, who have one parent Jew. They arrived in this school. You know, it's a primary school. So I think it doesn't look like your school in Winnipeg. It's small schools with typical Soviet monument about the victory of Red Army against German. They entered, a policeman entered in the school and say, you, 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 children from zero to six. They took them, they put them on cart and horses from different schools. And all these cards gather in the same place. I couldn't know that because of this witness. This witness, he was seven years old. He told me I stayed a full day watching. I said, what did you see? They shot in one day 1,100 children from zero to six. And I, I said, I don't understand how you can shoot children. He said it was very easy. A policeman took them from the court, they put them on the grave, they went back, and the Germans were shooting. And I said, but I don't understand. Children, they were not moving like that, trying to escape. He said, he told me no, because they saw how they killed the babies. For the babies, they smashed their head on the court. And they were so afraid to be killed, the head smashed on the cart, they prefer, they prefer to be shot. 
So you know, it was a very difficult interview. I, I remember, I, I asked him, do you remember how many babies you saw the head smashed on the cart? He told me, around 200. And suddenly, I realized he was seven years old, he was Ukrainian, so I said, perhaps he knew victims. I said, but you knew children? Yes, yes, he told me, two of my cousins have been shot. One name was da David, and the second was Boris. You know, for me, I will finish by that. When I interview him a long time, here he imitates the policeman who smashed the head of the babies and the cart. And I say, oh, a child, seven years old, a farmer from a small village, he could stay a full day watching the killing of 1,100 children the same age than him. So I asked him, why did you stay the full day? Why didn't you come back to your mother home? I will never forget his answer that I learned thousands of time. It was interesting for us children. So I would like to finish by that. I don't know, you are young today. You are in high school. You have your teachers. You are in a nice country, Canada. But perhaps one day you will be doctor. Perhaps one day you will be journalist. Perhaps one day you will be military in army or business worker in a country where there will be a mass killing, a genocide. Because the genocide are not finished. After happened Rwanda, after happened Cambodia, today there is Darfur, today there is every day mass shooting in Syria. Today there are mass shooting in Congo. And every morning when you open the TV, you listen, oh, yesterday they killed 34. Today they killed 22. This day, two. Please, the difference between 41 and now is that everybody of you, you have a small telephone with a capacity of taking a picture. So I would say, if you see that, if you see that just near to your house or to your nice hotel, there are shooting babies, you take your telephone, you take a picture, and you send to any network like CNN or others. You must be the next generation to protect the planet. You can do much more with one photo, but with anything. Thank you.